Ei, Rafei! Recebi o seu cachê lá na Chum TV. Uh -uh. Não quer dinheiro? Você vai aparecer na Cidelândia. Uh -uh. uh -uh. uh -uh. Ei, prefere me conte os caninhos como pagamento, Pepe Legal? Então tá combinado. Pode levar. Como dizem por aí, tal papai, tal filho. Shudino Saco TV Blog Brasil presents Sydneyland. And now your host, Walter Sidney. O nosso episódio de hoje vai falar sobre uma pessoa muito especial. Um homem misterioso. Paul Murray. A sua carreira, as suas principais histórias, em parceria com o grande Carl Falberg. Vocês vão ver agora imagens em Cinderland. Oi pessoal, eu sou o Paulo Ricardo Abad de Montenegro, colecionador e integrante do grupo Skills Cans. Eu sou um grande fã de Paul Murray e um dos responsáveis pela elaboração de vários dos especiais Disney virtuais que são produzidos pelo grupo. E esses especiais vocês podem acessar gratuitamente nos blogs Chute no Saco e A Gibiteca. Meu artista Disney preferido, Paul Murray, nasceu fazendeiro no Missouri em 25 de novembro de 1911. Autodidata no desenho, com 26 anos foi contratado para trabalhar numa estamparia, depois de mostrar o seu talento rascunhando as bordas da página da sua proposta de emprego. Em 1938, vendeu um piano que ganhou num concurso para ir até Hollywood estagiar como animador nos estúdios Disney, trabalhando de assistente de animação com o genial Fred Moore, o criador do Mickey contemporâneo. Essa fase, o próprio Murray relembra em suas cartas para o Wayne Jewel. The Disney Studios in 1938 were located in East Hollywood on Hyperion Avenue, near the Hyperion Bridge leading to Glendale. It was a simple strong out setup built in old Spanish style. It included quite a few small residential houses in the neighborhood, added to it due to needed expansion. Imagine an office complete with kitchen, bedrooms, dining room, bath, etc. Sounds modern, but was anything but that. At that time I had a friend, Joe Oriallo, working on the old Felix the Cat comic strips who had one whole house to himself. May sound good, but was pretty lonesome. You can imagine during the hot summers, trying to work without air conditioning? I was always located in the main building. The furniture was simple and cheaply built. The drawing desks were made by some carpenter of soft wood and painted orange and yellow. They were covered with carved initials and cigarette burns. We sat in old straight back kitchen type chairs, pretty hard on the human posterior, even with cushions stacked on them. Everyone was happy though and it actually was a paradise compared with other places. The freedom we had was almost unbelievable. We were given three days a week sick leave with full pay and no questions asked. If we were out more than three days during a week, we were then checked by the studio nurse and, if legitimate, our pay continued. As you can see, it was a good way to weed out the dead wood. We could pick up the phone and order anything to eat or drink not alcoholic we wanted and it would be delivered to our rooms. Some kept small refrigerators. We came and went from the studios as we pleased. There were no time clocks, no signing in or out. What if you were a couple hours late to work or left a couple hours too soon? The freedom seemed to be unlimited. And again, this would show up the dead wood. The result was the Disney Studios had the best talent in the industry. Of course, there were those who consistently abused these privileges and did not work and were released. My first encounter with Walt Disney himself will always stick in my memory. It amuses me now, but then, not so. 
I had only been there a few months, but was lucky enough to have the top animator, Fred Moore, take me under his wing. Fred and his unit always had a beer break at 3 o'clock every afternoon. Me, being the newcomer, had to collect the money from each one and go through the front gate over to Ma Applebaum's grocery, directly across the street, and buy the beer, then bring it back to the studio. After we drank it, I had to make the return trip back to return the empty bottles, which was also getting rid of the evidence. This had been going on for weeks without repercussions. Came the day when I was walking out the front gate loaded down with empty beer bottles, there stood Walt, talking with someone else. He looked me over as I walked by, but said nothing, and I wasn't about to say anything. I stalled around in the grocery, hoping he wouldn't be there, on my return trip. He was still there, never mentioning the beer bottles. I was a bit uneasy, not knowing what the results of that encounter would be. I immediately told Fred Moore what had happened, and he said not to worry about it. A few minutes later, he received a phone call from Walt asking Fred to come up to his office for a little talk. I heard no more about the incident, but needless to say, there were no more afternoon beer breaks. We played as much as we worked, but when we did work, we turned out a superior product which was what Walt wanted. I collaborated in the animation of these films, Dumbo, Song of the South, The Sorcerer's Apprentice, which I even adapted for the comics in 1953, and several short films. At Western Publishing, I've made stories with ducks, rats, and various other animals. For years ago, I worked with Dan Spiegel, a text of Don Christensen, and Mickey Mouse was a super secret agent. Suas personagens pinups também fizeram um grande sucesso nas revistas adultas, aguçando a imaginação do público da época. Em 1943, por ter colaborado com Alô Amigos e A Canção do Sul, foi escolhido para retratar respectivamente Zé Carioca, Panchito e o Coelho Quincas nas tiras de jornais. Em 1944, começa a desenhar também algumas tiras dominicais do próprio Mickey, até abril de 1946. Com o roteirista Dick Hummer, no início dos anos 50, criou as tiras non-Disney do simpático cowboy Buck O'Reilly. Na editora Western, era um desenhista de quadrinhos impressionante em sua produção, inclusive como capista, desenhando quase todos os personagens Disney. Sempre foi extremamente detalhista nos cenários de cada história, transportando os leitores para as aventuras que desenhava. Em parceria com Carl Falberg, enfrentou vilões como João Bafo de Onça e seus comparsas. E o Mancha Negra, roteirizado por Bob Ogle em aventuras emocionantes e inesquecíveis. E novos heróis surgiram através do seu traço, como o super pateta de Del Connell e o Vespa Vermelha de Cecil Beard. Sua última HQ do Mickey, Descontrole Remoto, foi publicada na Walt Disney Comics and Stories número 510, em 22 de março de 1984. Murray faleceu em 4 de agosto de 1989, cercado de seus oito filhos e 29 netos, na sua casa em Palmdale. finalizar frases de um outro fã de Paul Murray, o amigo César Brito, para Paulo Nero, dois saudosos e inesquecíveis esquilos do nosso grupo. Agora já me sinto mais tranquilo. Vamos nos aproximar mais e valorizar mais essa nossa vida disneyana, que não tem preço. Muitos abraços, com todo o meu apreço e respeito. Pessoal, tudo bem? É o seguinte, preciso falar com vocês uma coisa muito importante, mas eu tô com um certo receio. Eu vi uma sombra por aqui. Eu acho que era o Mancha Negra. Pode ser. Pode não ser. Olha só.